Good morning and welcome to this panel on otologic and neurologic impacts of COVID-19 infection and vaccination. When we initially planned this event in the spring of 2021, we weren't sure if this topic would be obsolete by this time. But of course, we still find ourselves with our lives profoundly changed by this ongoing pandemic. We've put together an all-star panel today of our colleagues who have conducted clinical and basic science studies related to this novel infection and also to the novel vaccines. In designing these talks, we wanted to make sure to focus on new knowledge and techniques that have, that have been developed in the context of this pandemic, but may advance the field of otology and neurotology in the future as we confront other disease processes down the line. Additionally, we want to note importantly that, of course, this pandemic is evolving, as is the science. And so these updates reflect the science and our understanding as things stand today, but of course may be subject to change in the future. So with that, I'd like to get this panel started. I've organized this panel as a series of questions and answers with each of the panelists, followed by a general discussion with our audience. So please send in your comments and questions. Uh, via the Q&A tab. So our first speaker today is Dr. Eldre Birkis. I heard Dr. Birkis speak in the depths of the pandemic uh, before we had the vaccine uh, on NPR actually um, about her experience as an audiologist and some of the new symptoms that were being described and studied by her and her group um, related to COVID-19 infection. So my first question for you, uh, Dr. Birkis, is what symptoms did patients describe following COVID-19 infection? And were there any accompanying clinical signs or testing results uh, that were associated with these symptoms? Great, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to be on this panel. And so to answer that question, I'll just give you a bit of background about what I've been researching. So at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, I was really concerned, particularly about my tinnitus patients, because I know there's such a big link between increased anxiety and exasperated tinnitus. And this got me um, started on research. So I had three main research themes that I was interested. The first was the impact of COVID-19 on tinnitus. The second was the impact on the pandemic on tinnitus. And the third was the implications for our audiology practice. And what I wanted to do with the research is make sure that it wasn't just focused on one clinic or one population or one country. I really wanted to see what the global picture was because it was a global pandemic. And, and I did a, a survey study which included more than 3,000 people and, and th thanks to my team of collaborators who helped to translate the survey. And we um, got responses from people in 48 countries, although the majority were from North America and Europe. And this gave us a lot of insight. And um, at the start of the pandemic, I and my colleagues really weren't aware that um, tinnitus could be initiated after getting the COVID um, virus so that wasn't forefront of our minds but we got lots of people that were saying this was happening and um, so first of all what, what we did is is did a systematic review and looked at the research that was out there so um there were about 20 23 publications on tinnitus and COVID-19 and out of these 28 studies we're looking at the new incidence of tinnitus after getting infected. Some of them were just case studies. Um, but looking at that combined prevalence, it looked like about 8% of people after getting infected were saying that they did get tinnitus um, and less so getting hearing loss and vertigo. And there have been some other systematic reviews with more or less the same percentages. Um, but this is always difficult because we need to consider that the incidence of new tinnitus is about 1% per year in, in any given year and we don't always know what those causes are. So we have to factor that into the calculation. And so the next big question was, if you did get the COVID-19, but you had pre-existing tinnitus, what happened to your tinnitus? And from the populations we studied, um, not that many had had COVID 
about 237 people with pre-existing tinnitus, but 40% of them said that their tinnitus was exasperated, although the majority, 54%, said their tinnitus was the same, and 6% said it was better. And I think um, those that said it was better was because they had a change perspective. They realized how bad some illnesses could be, and that made them focus less on their tinnitus. So the third question was about the pandemic. So how did the pandemic affect tinnitus? And from this, we found that about a third of people said their tinnitus was much worse during the pandemic than it normally was, their pre-existing tinnitus. 67% was stable and 1% said their tinnitus improved during the pandemic. And I maybe thought that 1% would be bigger because some people find if they're more peaceful and the world's quieter, their tinnitus isn't as bad. But we found that the majority of people that found it more bothersome were those that were below the age of 50 and females. And this could be because they had a bigger lifestyle change, maybe a bigger work change, having to, to change to working at home and to do homeschooling. So the next question I also had was who was more affected? So what other factors? Because those would be the people that we really need to focus on and, and try to get them um, additional support. And I found it was mostly those people that were self-isolating, the people that were lonely during the pandemic, the people that were really emotionally distressed during the pandemic, and the people that were having bigger sleep problems. And I also wanted to see from those people that were coping well, what made them cope well? And, and it was quite interesting what they said. The thing that helped people the most was having a lot of social support and also spending time in nature. So I think that improved quality of life and relaxation, doing things outdoors. So that gave us a lot of, a lot of tips. Um, and I also looked at how many people were accessing services. And it was interesting, during the start of the pandemic, almost nobody was accessing tinnitus services. But those people that were said their tinnitus was less bothersome. So our services do work, but I think a lot of people didn't know how to access them during the pandemic. And, and what I also wanted to see is what suggestions but did people have for help they needed during the pandemic. And, and I think a big thing that came up was support wasn't accessible in the beginning. There wasn't a range of therapies available to them and they felt the professionals that were that did contact didn't always understand problems specifically with tinnitus and, and they weren't able to get hearing aids during that time and affordable hearing aids. And other things that, that were said is also they just want more research into tinnitus generally and finding a cure with tinnitus and more awareness of tinnitus, which I think has somewhat come up during the pandemic. There's been more media support. So that's been great. And, and so hopefully all the negatives of the, of the pandemic also feed into positives and can feed into our understanding of, clinic, um, of tinnitus patients. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Birgis look forward to hearing more about this during the Q&A. So our next speaker is Dr. Matt Stewart, a colleague of mine, and who did some really important work again during the pandemic that really helped us and gave insight to us otologic and neurologic surgeons in terms of understanding that uh, our surgery also resulted in aerosolization of uh, mucosa containing the virus. And this was really pivotal in terms of our understanding of our own risks. So my question to you is to sort of revisit the work that you've done and share with us, you know, what is the evidence you found that COVID-19 causes an infection in the ear and temporal bone? And can you describe some of the exciting new methodologies that you developed that might that will likely be very useful to our field going forward in uncover, uncovering some of these insights? Thank you, Matt. Yes, thank you very much uh, for having me, Dr. Agawal. I really appreciate that. And also my gratitude to the, uh, to the ANS as well as to um, the patients and families who have donated their uh, loved ones to our mortality-based research. Um, early or early in December, really, about one in a thousand United States citizens had passed from the COVID-19 pandemic. And just this past month, we now have one in 500 US citizens who've died um, since early 2020, which really means that we won't have any families or coworkers 
um, or patients that um, that haven't been affected by the most severe aspect of COVID, including members in this audience. So my uh, my appreciation and condolences to you. The um, the main in, uh, the main starting point for our work really was trying to understand what was there. Uh, the basis for any evidence of a um, SARS-CoV-2 or a coronavirus infection in the middle ear. And we really relied on this study uh, that looked at uh, viruses in the nasopharynx and middle ear and infusions in children. And this did have an isolation of a single coronavirus. And this uh, understanding that there was an infection in the middle ear and perhaps in the temporal bone really led to our uh, national and international guidelines of various societies about what it meant um, to have uh, healthcare practitioners who might be um, associated or, or affected by aerosolized particles. And then in addition to the excellent talk that we just heard, I, I might also um, add that there was some early evidence um, that asymptomatic individuals uh, that were identified by antibody testing, um, uh, when they underwent comprehensive audio audiometry, were found to have some evidence of peripheral dysfunction in the term of um, of hair cell function. So this was a, a very interesting and intriguing idea. So we re initially reported three patients uh, where we um, we had SARS-CoV-2 uh, infected patients who died of SARS in the hospital and their families donated their remains to autopsy. In order to sample this part of the body, uh, we had to overcome some significant challenges, particularly which in a BSL-3 type setting, uh, we're not allowed to use any powered instrumentation according to CDC guidelines. In that setting, we sort of revisited some historical techniques of accessing the temporal bone using the hammer and gouge techniques, using osteotomes and curettes to perform a cortical mastoidectomy down to the level of the abdus at antrum, sampling those uh, mastoid uh, bone fragments and then performing a swab test of the middle ear. We then performed RT-PCR of those samples and found that we had uh, significant positivity in the uh, in all four areas uh, in an initial report of three patients. We've continued that work and now have 29 cases in our COVID autopsy uh, series. And overall, there's 61% positivity in any particular site. As time has gone by, um, however, we've um, tried to understand additional parts of the body and then tried to get an insight into additional types of um, of uh, a mechanism for infection. So just a quick review of a little bit of molecular virology for SARS-CoV-2. Um, essentially, host cell infection really is gonna rely on uh, expression of three separate components uh, by that particular host cell. It's well known about the ACE2 receptor positivity um, that's been studied in many parts of the body, including the nasopharynx, as well as the uh, human cochlea. But there was a group out of Japan um, led by Yuranaka et al. that really looked at uh, the first human, uh, I'm sorry, the first uh, study of host cell expression in any species, in this case, the mouse, looking at the um, uh, host cell expression of the ACE2 receptor, as well as another membrane uh, receptor, Tempris2, a transmembrane protease, and then an intracellular expression of furin, a required element for successful uh, translation of the positive um, strand uh, mRNA of SARS-CoV-2. This is a detail of the Yurinaka study. It's an extremely elegant investigation of, uh, of mouse temporal bones with expression uh, characteristic patterns for ACE2, Tempers2, and furin in the cochlea, specifically in the organ of corti, in the stria vascularis, and the spiral ganglion. And this was a really inspirational study for us because we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and not just understand that there might be RT-PCR positivity for SARS-CoV-2 virus, but to help understand mechanisms that might explain the otologic symptoms associated with infections, such as the ones we've just, uh, we've just heard about. Well, it turns out that we also had to overcome some significant um, technological issues of how to access other parts of the body besides a cortical mastoidectomy. And at that time, there was a tremendous unmet need for uh, brain tissue. So we expanded some of those uh, traditional techniques of using an osteotome to use a full calivarial incision with an osteotome to perform calivarial removal, dural excision, and then whole brain excision. This allowed access to the middle fossa to perform temporal bone harvest using the four incision technique um, that has, uh, since the late 1950s and early 1960s, has been replaced by powered saw techniques. That block of temporal bone allows us to uh, 
and then take uh, that individual section and you can see in the upper right what that looks like mounted in a chuck and at least then we can access that temporal bone now we had to adapt some um, some other techniques to get into the temporal bone because as we all know it's an extremely hard part of the body there are micro slice techniques described uh, from the united kingdom um, in the 1980s and the 1990s and combining that with um, some other techniques, we've been able to do a dual slice technique to get this um, section of the temporal bone you see down there. And ultimately, from harvest to immunohistochemistry histology uh, now takes about 14 days or so. Here's an example of middle ear mucosa with an H&E stain with preservation of the ar architecture of the apical membrane, cilia, as well as mucin and the ACE2, CHIMPRS2, and FURIN2 expression in the middle ear. And just an example of what it might look like um, in the ganglion uh, for the spiral ganglion, scarpus ganglion. It's really going to help us identify uh, mechanisms for direct infection, the peripheral effects of viral infection, neuronal infection, immediate and local vascular and inflammatory responses as well as the indirect central effects of vascular and inflammatory reactions. Thank you again. I really appreciate your time today. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Stewart, for, that, for those important and ongoing contributions to our field. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Tina Stankovich, um, who also has made significant contributions in her laboratory that relate certainly to our understanding of COVID-19 infection in the inner ear, and I think also create a platform for us to understand uh, diseases of the inner ear moving forward. So Dr. Stankovich, welcome. And I will ask you a similar question. Um, what is the evidence that you and your group have garnered that COVID-19 causes an infection in, in the inner ear? And can you please describe some of the exciting platforms and technical advances that your group has developed in the context of this uh, pandemic that will likely be game changers moving forward? Thank you so much, Dr. Agrawal, for this opportunity to present our unpublished data. Uh, this is a multi-institutional collaboration uh, that includes not only basic research into the mechanisms of direct SARS-CoV-2 infection of the human inner ear, but also a case series of uh, well-documented audiovestibular symptoms in 10 patients uh, who really inspired this basic research that I'm about to describe. So we just heard from Dr. Stewart about three key proteins that are required for a viral infection of host cells. And basically, uh, we know that a spike protein on coronavirus binds to the ACE2 receptor on host cells. And then there are two enzymes, furin and tempris 2 that cleave the spike. And it's this cleavage of the spike that allows fusion of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane and release of uh, viral mRNA into the cell, which leads to translation and uh, packaging of new viral particles. So our step was to determine whether ACE2, furin, and tempris 2 are expressed in human inner ear tissue. We all know that uh, it's not easy to get hold of human inner ear tissue. However, we do get it during indicated surgeries, such as labyrinthectomy for intractable Meniere's disease or translabyrinthine uh, vestibular schwannoma resection. So we first demonstrated that the tissues that we remove from the inner ear indeed contain hair cells shown here in pink and uh, neurites shown here in green. Next, we demonstrated that uh, these hair cells abundantly express the three proteins required for viral infection, where ACE2 and furin are really co-localized in the apical surface of hair cells. And uh, tempestru is expressed more along the basal lateral surface. We similarly see that Schwann cells express uh, these proteins, but not really neurites of um, vestibular neurons. Uh, now then, that we know that they express the proteins required for the virus to get in, uh, can the virus actually directly infect these cells? And the answer is yes. Uh, we performed this experiment where we cultured human 
uh, vestibular tissue for several days and infected them uh, with the virus. And you can see in the top row that shows infected cells versus uh, the bottom row that shows uh, mock uh, experiments that hair cells are very readily infected by the virus as evidenced by pink staining of double-stranded RNA. Uh, and hair cells are uh, much more readily infected than Schwann cells in comparison or neurites. Uh, the next step was then to see, um, can we use human inner ear models of hearing loss because we are so limited in human primary inner ear tissue. But if we use stem cells, then we are never limited in the number of cells. So the approach is that we start with uh, human tissues, uh, namely blood or skin. We differentiate them into uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, which we then uh, differentiate into either two-dimensional cells, such as uh, otic prosensory cells, Schwann cell progenitors, or spiral ganglion neurons, or we let them uh, self-assemble into three-dimensional organoids. Uh, these cellular models can then be used for a variety of downstream applications, including better understanding of disease mechanisms, functional assays, cell therapies, and drug testing. So the first step was to see whether uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived otic prosensory cells shown in the bottom in the middle row or Schwann cell progenitors shown in the bottom row express these three proteins of interest compared to induced pluripotent stem cells that they were derived from shown in the top row. And the answer is yes, they express all three proteins and the differentiated cells express them at higher levels. Uh, and moreover, when we directly expose these cells to SARS-CoV-2, uh, it very uh, readily infects these cell types and otic prosensory cells much more so than Schwann cell progenitors. Next, we made human inner ear organoids uh, derived from induced pluripotent stem cells. And you can see these uh, hair cells uh, stained for Myo7A, uh, lining the lumen of the organoids. And they very abundantly express ACE2, which is here shown in purple. Moreover, when we expose these organoids to the virus, the virus uh, very readily infects cells, mostly hair cells, to a lesser degree Schwann cell uh, Schwann cells and to an even lesser degree neurites. So taken together, I have shown you the evidence for direct viral infection of human inner ear tissue, both adult tissue and uh, cells and organoids derived from human-induced pluripotent stem cells. So that begs the question of how does the virus get in? Uh, there are multiple possible pathways. One is through the nose and olfactory foramina where it gets into the CSF and seeds uh, cranial nerves. Uh, another uh, option is uh, via the endolymphatic sac, uh, or it could get into the inner ear hematogenously via the labyrinthine artery. Uh, and yet another approach is through the ear canal, middle ear, and mastoid, as we heard from Dr. Stewart's talk. So thank you for the opportunity to present this work. Thank you so much, Dr. Stankovic. It's incredibly uh, fascinating. Um, and technologically advanced work for us. Um, so we're gonna switch gears and talk now about the otologic and neurologic impacts of COVID-19 vaccination. So that was sort of the, the second era of this pandemic that we're facing. Um, and for that, the latter three speakers um, will discuss their clinical experience um, and thinking through about you know, the impacts of the, the vaccine, the era that we're in currently. So our next speaker is Dr. Anna Kim. And I'd like Dr. Kim, uh, who is based out of New York City, to comment on what symptoms did your patients describe following vaccination against COVID-19? Were there any accompanying clinical signs or testing results uh, that you discerned? And I also wanted to um, invite you to share some of the reflections that you had uh, under experiencing the experiencing this pandemic in New York City uh, in the early days, also as the residency program director. I remember reading some of your accounts uh, sort of from the front line and managing our trainees during this period. And I'd love to hear um, if you're interested in sharing some of those um, experiences as well. So welcome. Thanks, Dr. Agarwal, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share New York City's experience with COVID having been ground zero early on in the pandemic. 
Although the main Columbia Medical Campus is located on the upper Manhattan called uh, Washington Heights, our outpatient office is located in Midtown on 51st Street, shown here. The front facade of the building was all boarded up due to the looting that was happening in the area. Subways, Grand Central, which is the hub for trains coming in from the tri-state region, and Times Square, all usually packed with commuters and tourists, remained a ghost town for months. Most stores, like the one shown here across from the Midtown office in Rockefeller Center, where the iconic Christmas tree stands every year, also remained boarded up for quite some time. It was surreal. We felt isolated from the rest of the country, certainly, before the other states started to experience the same thing in coming months. Scene was very different at the Maine Medical Center in Washington Heights. For the non-New Yorkers, Washington Heights is bordered by Harlem and the Bronx. Due to the overwhelming number of patients presenting to Columbia, the PACU and OR rooms were converted into COVID units, and our department was deployed to help out. We were given crash courses on vent settings and pressers, but let's face it, the ER and ICU docs knew better than to trust us with those important decisions. So we were delegated to patient transport, blood draws, checking x-rays for ET and NG2 placement, and whatever we could do to help out. Not even the department chair uh, was exempt from deployment. Underneath all that plastic is Dr. Larry Lustig in the upper left panel, along with one of our rhinologists, Dr. Dave Gudis. All our residents but one were deployed to help out in the COVID units as well all while being rationed one N95 mask to last as long as possible, and discussions of re-sterilizing them given the shortage of PPEs early on. Within a few months, however, I, our fi a department finally had a role uh, with, a, with something we were familiar with, and we quickly became busy with COVID trachs, performing 10 to 20 a week easily. Some residents didn't feel comfortable going home to their young children during the early phases when so much was unknown. So they chose to live apart from their family. But they found ways to support each other via Zoom as shown on the lower right panel. Uh, they were just getting together to decompress, to keep up their morales and to maintain some form of human connection. They, they, as all of the faculty, we've never seen so much death on a daily basis before. New York City has a population of 8 million. At our peak around April and May, we were clocking in at about 10,000 new cases per day, an average of up close to 1,000 deaths per, per day. Our residents rotate the Columbia and Cornell, two campuses very different socioeconomically. As such, they also got a crash lesson on healthcare inequality. But being ground zero also provided an opportunity to ask questions never before asked, one of which I will be presenting this morning. Uh, for some reason, we're uh, skipping over the title slide, but uh, Stephen uh, Lung is one of our medical students. Uh, at Columbia, and Dr. Tay is our current neurotology fellow, who also uh, is a proud recipient of this year's ANS uh, research grant. A questionnaire was uh, regarding otologic symptoms uh, from COVID infection, if applicable, and symptoms within four weeks of vaccination was administered to 500 patients presenting to the otologist. Of the 500, 420 reported being vaccinated with the type of vaccine they received listed here. Pfizer to Moderna, two to one, a very small percentage of J&J. 87, uh, 87 patients presented uh, reported having COVID infection. Otologic symptoms were reported in 14.5% of patients versus 27.6% in COVID-infected patients who subsequently received the vaccination. Dizziness was the most common at 7.9%, followed by tinnitus and subjective hearing loss. 
of the 500 patients, seven patients had audio confirming their hearing loss. Four received Pfizer, three Moderna. Five patients after the second dose of the vaccine and two patients after the first dose. Overall incidence was 1.67% in our study, which is similar to Chari's group, who reported an incidence of sudden sensory neural hearing loss at 1.77 in 2019 and 1.91 in 2020 in patients presenting to Mass Cyanier, concluding that COVID-19 does not appear to increase the risk for sudden sensory neural hearing loss. But just to put things into perspective, in 2013, Harris's group reported an annual incidence of idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss at 0.027%. Whether this is a true uptick in sudden sensory neural hearing loss over the years or whether it's due to better awareness or so patients presenting to us uh, is unclear at this time. Individual pure tones are shown here on presentation. Of the seven, two had history of COVID infection. Six of the seven patients were treated with steroid and four ultimately referred for cochlear implant evaluation. Two has since undergone CI surgery with outcome too early to evaluate at this time. We clearly need more data point before final conclusions can be drawn. Much like patients with mild idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss who never present to healthcare provide, providers, so too may those with mild hearing loss from COVID infection and vaccination, thereby not capturing the true picture. I thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share our experience with the group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim, and also for sharing some of your own personal experiences. And I think we all experienced it differently, obviously, but it was um, felt in a, obviously in a very profound way um, by our colleagues in New York City. Our next speaker is Dr. Daniel Sun, uh, who has published uh, some important information regarding uh, looking more carefully at sudden hearing loss and COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and my question to you, Dr. Sun, is what is the evidence regarding sudden hearing loss and COVID-19 vaccination? And also in terms of setting up our specialty for leveraging resources that we've perhaps learned more about during this pandemic, uh, can you also comment on some of the national level resources that are out there uh, that may be helpful in terms of giving insights and what might be some of their strengths and even limitations? So thank you and welcome, Dr. Sun. Thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal, and thank you very much, ANS, for having me. So as um, uh, Dr. Kim uh, just spoke about, uh, I think all of us have, um, as of this point, have seen patients presenting with sudden hearing loss after COVID vaccination. Uh, we wanted to get a national snapshot uh, of um, uh, the incidence estimate associated with this phenomenon. This poses an incredible challenge for clinicians, for patients, and given the lack of true epidemiologic studies, we wanted to uh, use the uh, CDC vaccine adverse events database to see if we can find a national snapshot that gets us a national incidence estimate. We specifically focused on sudden sensory neural hearing loss um, because it's well defined, it has objective cr criteria, and uh, it's more likely to be reported and where the population incidence um, is somewhat known. So uh, the CDC VAERS database is a public reporting system where anyone can submit a report and all reports are publicly accessible. It was initially in, uh, created as a post-market surveillance tool to detect adverse events, rare adverse events associated with any vaccine. Uh, verified uh, VAERS data is then used by the CDC for uh, national vaccine safety studies. Uh, to give um, uh, people a sense of the incident reports that are submitted, here are a couple of vignettes of um, the reports. So this is a report that's submitted by a healthcare provider and even though it mentions hearing loss, it's quickly apparent that uh, it's not true sudden sensory neural hearing loss after the vaccination. In contrast, these are two reports submitted by patients. And uh, uh, even though uh, they are submitted by patients, uh, they contain very specific information that discusses their audiometric findings, their treatment, 
and even the institution that they were treated at. So um, before we get further, it's important to recognize that uh, in using pre-verified incident reports, uh, we cannot ascertain, obviously, the true nature of the hearing loss or whether it really happened at all. Likewise, we don't have audiometric data uh, to define hearing loss in terms of academy criteria. And there are also other issues associated with using this database that I'll address um, in how we approach this issue. So uh, to start, uh, the green um, panel shows the national uh, number of vaccinations given by day. In the bottom panel, the gray bars show the number of instant reports submitted by submitted to the CDC. And we see a correlation between the number of doses given and the number of reports submitted for sudden hearing loss. However, the dashed line shows the uh, number of reports on a per dose basis. And we see that initially there is a high reporting rate that's been decreasing steadily with time. Likewise, we wanted to um, address whether uh, the a novel mRNA lipid nanoparticle technology associated with two of the manufacturers could be uh, causing increased number of cases of sudden hearing loss. And we saw that based on the instant reports that there was no elevated reporting rate um, uh, for the Pfizer Moderna vaccines compared to the more traditional mechanism of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We then tried to um, obtain an incidence estimate on a national level and this is the uh, approach that was used. So after extraction and deduplication, um, we um, imposed a inclusion exclusion criteria to define what we term as probable sudden sensory neural hearing loss cases. The main two features of this criteria is number one, it had to be temporal correlation within three weeks of vaccine dose. And number two, there had to be high credibility of reporting um, which we define as either report submitted by a healthcare provider or it contained documentation of hearing loss or steroid treatment. We were then able to obtain a national estimate of about 0 0.6 per 100,000 persons per year in terms of sudden sensory neural hearing loss occurring three weeks after vaccination. Because the um, uh, VAERS database contains unverified data, uh, we wanted to mitigate the assumptions used by performing a sensitivity analysis. So in the table, we define a maximum case scenario where we use the maximum number of cases reported, meaning all cases reported, uh, we assume to be true sensory neural hearing loss. We then uh, estimate the minimum population size by, uh, to minimize the denominator and then on top of that, impose an additional 100% underreporting bias. This provided us with the maximum incident scenario based on VAERS data, uh, which um, yielded 28 um, uh, uh, cases per 100,000 persons per year. We then contextualized this number uh, with um, the uh, study by Dr. Uh, Harris that Dr. Kim cited previously. And we saw that it did not exceed uh, the uh, population incidence of idiopathic hearing loss found in that study. So this is uh, not a true epidemiologic study. Oh, sorry. Uh, we uh, then also analyzed a series of patients from three collaborating institutions, uh, Hopkins, uh, Mass and Ear, and uh, uh, Ophthalmology Practice in Annapolis. Um, we found, we looked at the, uh, the timing of since sudden sensory neural hearing loss uh, after vaccination. We found that the peak fell at within 48 hours and the second smaller peak at seven days. So this is not a true uh, epidemiologic study. And we they like to point our field's attention to studies such as this. Uh, which um, uh, have addressed the issue of um, sudden hearing loss after other vaccines, such as the flu vaccine, uh, to yield definitive studies that prove that uh, sudden hearing loss was not associated with flu vaccination, for instance. So in conclusion, uh, pre preliminarily at a population level, there's not an increased incidence of sudden hearing loss after COVID-19 vaccination compared to the natural incidence of idiopathic sudden hearing loss. Could there be a biological link in certain rare individuals? 
I think that's a question that uh, uh, we need to look at uh, further. We've certainly had patients that sustain sudden hearing loss recurrently after each dose of the vaccine. And finally, most importantly, we urge clinicians to report all cases uh, of adverse events to the CDC virus database so that future systematic, systematic studies can be conducted. Thank you very much. And I just want to acknowledge our co-authors and our team. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Sun, uh, for that uh, excellent presentation. I think uh, you know, definitely a lot of uh, interest to get a lot of input on that from our uh, audience today. So the final speaker on our panel is Dr. Kristen Steenerson, uh, who brings a neurology point of view to the panel. And I know a number of us uh, in the context of uh, seeing patients who've been vaccinated for COVID uh, saw patients with a number of symptoms that were otologic and neurologic, not necessarily even sense, sudden sense neural hearing loss, but um, a broader array of symptoms. And you know there was some uh, hypothesizing that perhaps these symptoms may be related to uh, an exacerbation of an underlying inflammatory state, perhaps related to migraine. Uh, and so we really sought out uh, some input from Dr. Steenerson uh, to provide some insight into, into these possible links. So um, my question to you, Dr. Steenerson, is can you comment on some mechanisms by which the COVID-19 vaccine may cause otologic and neurologic symptoms? Thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal, and thank you to the ANS for this opportunity to participate. Um, so just as Dr. Agarwal introduced, I am hoping to give a brief overview of the mechanisms for vaccine-related neurotologic and otologic symptoms. So the first uh, mechanism I'd like to focus on is immune activation. So as many of us probably are aware, there is a possibility following vaccination of some aberrant immune activation resulting in pathology. This is typically associated with an infection, but due to the mechanisms of these immunizations, it is possible that a role for molecular mimicry, hypersensitivity reactions, or vasculitic events may cause lo localized vestibular or cochlear impacts that could result in symptoms. The data for this is really minimal at best, and so this is something that I consider a possibility, but data is still lacking. The next mechanism that I consider every single day in my practice is, is this migraine related? Um, so as many of you are probably aware, migraine commonly causes neurootologic manifestations. There are several mechanisms that go into this clinical presentation, but one commonly understood is trigeminovascular dysregulation can affect both vestibular and co cochlear function. We know that trigeminovascular dysregulation is a really important um, aspect of potential side effects related to vaccination. Headache is a really common side effect following vaccination. There are many theories behind this, but that trigeminovascular dysregulation is acted upon by many anti-inflammatory substances, including nitric oxide, prostaglandins, and cytokines, which likely act as triggers for headaches. And we know that headaches can increase the risk for activating underlying migraines as they are a state of function change, as well as any state of function change in general can activate migraines, such as sleep deprivation, stress, barometric pressure changes, a new introduction of medication like a vaccination. There are already studies identifying that COVID-19 vaccine does increase headaches. So over 70% of vaccinated individuals, these were looking at the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccines, had headache within 24 hours following vaccination, um, which was much greater compared to the con control group of 37%, which is not negligible, um, but still significant. And of these, about 28% had migraineous features. So understanding this potential activation of immune responses that could highlight a headache than migraine pathway, it's possible neurotologic symptoms could be um, triggered following vaccine in a migraine mechanism. As Dr. Sun and Dr. Formeister have already looked into, coincidental events cannot be um, underregarded either. So sudden sensory neural hearing loss, tinnitus have already been identified as similar rates in the general population as compared to those following vaccination. And probably most of us have recognized in our clinical experience that there is greater vigilance among patients and probably physicians alike in terms of symptom uh, profiling and symptom cataloging that may be more um, highlighted compared to in a non-vaccination setting. The next mechanism that I'd really like to highlight is known as somatic symptom disorders. 
There are many synonyms for these in the medical literature, psychogenic illness, mind-body illness, nocebo effect, mass hysteria is a pejorative term and recommended not to be used. Um, there's also an immunization specific term for somatic symptom disorder known as anxiety-related adverse effects following immunizations or anxiety-related AEFI. These are not a diagnosis of exclusion. So a lovely study looking at, again, Johnson & Johnson va post-vaccination um, symptoms show that there are very clearly defined clusters of symptoms that had this phenotype of lightheaded and dizziness being the most common, greater than 50%, pallor or diaphoresis, syncope, nausea, vomiting, and hypotension that um, were um, identified following vaccination. They looked at over five mass vaccination sites, and they found this very clear signal of this increased symptom profile um, in patients following vaccination. This is, I think, a really powerful um, consideration when it comes to post-vaccination events. Um, the higher the profile of the vaccine, the higher the um, amount of mass media contact, the more likelihood there is of a somatic symptom disorder. There's this really wonderful um, chapter written by Bob Balo from UCLA talking about this nocebo response and the um, mass psychogenic illness incidents that can occur. And there, this has been documented in several different disease processes, um, but specifically for vaccines, the higher the profile, the higher likelihood it, there is of this occurring. The final mechanism that I'd like to um, review is known as the path of least resistance or locus minoris resistance so the general background of this is anytime there has been an injury in any organ system, there's an altered defense capacity. The idea is that this is our path of least resistance when our body is um, stressed by another external factor. We see this in various areas of medicine, such as hepatic carcinoma following uh, in a cirrhotic liver, lung carcinoma and a tuberculosis scar. But in neurology, we see this really commonly following stroke. We call it anamnestic recall of stroke symptoms. The general concept is that in those patients who have had a stroke previously, if they have an infection such as pneumonia or urinary tract infection, they can have a recall that is identical to their prior stroke, so severe that it looks as though they're having another stroke. The reason I think this is relevant is with my vestibular patients, we talk about how their prior vestibular injury may be activated to such a severe level following vaccination because this is a bodily stressor that it may appear to be a new disease process or a new burden for them to endure. Just like the stroke recall, um, these should be completely reversible. And in our practice, we have seen very similar patterns of having a significant exacerbation and then complete reversal within days to weeks following their vaccination. So those are the mechanisms I wanted to highlight. I have some references, including that wonderful chapter on um, mass illness, um, but I appreciate the time and look forward to questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Steenerson. Uh, so we'll now invite all the panelists back and uh, we will have all the papers open for discussion. And please submit your questions uh, to the Q&A. We have several that have come through, which we will go through and answer. Wonderful. So um, thank you all so much for participating in this panel. I think you know the pandemic obviously has had all of us suffer a lot of loss, a lot of us internationally. Um, but I think there have been some bright lights and silver linings with you know, the heroic acts that we've heard about from some of our colleagues and also just the inspiring work that a number of us have um, moved to achieve to bring our whole field forward. So uh, thank you to you all for that. So um, let me start. I think one of the earlier questions we had was from Dr. Jeff Sharon, a question for Dr. Matt Stewart. Uh, did viral positivity in the middle ear correlate with otologic symptoms in the autopsy cohort? Yes, thank you. That's an excellent question. And in the vast majority of cases, we really had no idea of what the predisposing symptoms were. Um, and in that, in that era, um, Many of the patients came in uh, tunded or intubated without the ability to provide any type of reliable history. Um, so we just don't have reliable information about what their uh, photologic uh, symptom suite was prior to the severity of their illness. But we're definitely part of our um, post-acute recovery syndrome um, work here 
uh, is to try to uh, glean any and all of that type of information from the entire medical record for our entire cohort of COVID recovery patient subjects. Thank you. Great, thank you. And another question from Dr. Chandrasekhar. Great panel presentations. Uh, Dr. Kim, is it also possible that we saw more sudden sensorineural hearing loss patients as we were only seeing emergencies for a significant amount of time during the height of the New York City pandemic? So when you actually compare the um, actual audiograms of those people, patients who presented with hearing loss, the percentages are similar to what Mass Sionier is reporting before the pandemic. So actually the, the numbers have not gone up with the vaccination. I apologize if that wasn't clear during my presentation. Great, thank you. A question for Dr. Steenerson from Dr. Habib Brisk. Uh, I had a case of post-vaccine cerebellar ataxia. Patient is a physician with symptoms started after two days, were self-resolving after 14 days. BNG showed downbeat nystagmus in the acute phase. Some other vaccines have caused similar post-vaccine ataxia. Any insight on mechanisms, uh, RAN vaccine versus more traditional vaccines? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, there is still the possibility for an immune activation syndrome. And interestingly, cerebellitis seems to be most susceptible to those types of activations. Um, it would be interesting to know their history prior, if they had any prior cerebellar insults, stroke, vestibular cerebellar dysfunction that may have been reactivated following the vaccine itself. Um, but that's a really interesting case. And another follow-on question for Dr. Steenerson uh, from Dr. Chandrasekhar. How much do you think the media frenzy and mis uh, disinformation contribute to these symptoms after vaccination? Uh, how do we engage patients to counsel them you know, where they are? That's an excellent question. They did do a comparison looking at those um, post-vaccination AEFIs com flu compared to COVID-19 vaccine. And for um, the flu vaccine, about 0 0.05 out of 100,000 um, patients would have post-vaccination symptoms compared to eight out of 100,000 for those following COVID vaccine. And the one of the main leading um, ideas behind this is the more exposure we have to mass media, the more fear mongering, the more um, uh, increase in anticipatory anxiety related to um, undergoing this vaccination likely is the cause for this increased incidence. In terms of counseling, I usually talk to patients as if this were claustrophobia related to an MRI. So trying to understand ways to reduce um, their concern about a, re a reaction, as well as work on stress management techniques, if that's mindfulness, if that's anxiolytics, um, to try and help reduce that stress response as much as possible. Thank you. And uh, another question from Dr. John Carey, and I think this is a conversation we had when we were backstage prior to the panel. Uh, wonderful panel. What do we say to the patient who asks for a letter of exemption for a vaccination mandate based on prior otologic disease? So I think we've likely all um, faced that. Um, I think Dr. Kim, you were talking about your experience with that. Did you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I tell them we need larger data, but so far what we're seeing is not so much an increase in, in risk for hearing loss than it is vertigo. So uh, we tend to encourage them to vaccinate unless their you know, underlying medical um, issues are contraindicated. Indicative of the vaccination. Yes, I would agree with that. In my own practice, I haven't found certainly any literature to support granting such an exemption, and so you know, I, I typically do not offer it. And another question here uh, for Dr. Steenerson from Dr. Shragi: uh, Can we expect possibility of side effects more in a subgroup of patients with a history of autoimmune disorders? So, so far, we haven't seen that borne out of literature. There may be a reduced response to vaccination, but there does not seem to be an increased side effect profile, at least that I'm aware of. Great. Um, I have a question for Dr. Stankovic. Um, I was wondering in your uh, studies, did you see that the virus had a predilection for cochlear versus vestibular hair cells? 
That's a great question. And we don't know the answer to that because our models focus on vestibular cells. Uh, when collecting uh, human inner ear tissue from surgeries, uh, we were focused on vestibular epithelium. And when deriving these cells uh, and organoids in particular, we use the protocol that makes vestibular-like hair cells. Uh, and experiments are ongoing making uh, cochlear-like uh, organoids. Uh, that is more involved uh, in terms of um, the specific steps. And uh, all of these experiments uh, were really conducted stem cell experiments at the peak of the pandemic when, as you recall, most labs were shut down. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be allowed to keep going because we were doing uh, COVID-19 related work. So basically your question remains to be addressed and uh, we hope to have more insight going forward, but certainly mouse studies uh, that Dr. Stewart referred to and that we replicated in our most recent studies do show that uh, cochlear uh, and vestibular hair cells express it as well as um, uh, cochlear and vestibular neurons. I mean, express the proteins required for viral entry. But whether uh, cochlear hair cells versus vestibular hair cells are more susceptible, we don't know. However, I did not have time to describe our case series that involves 10 patients with documented audiograms during and after uh, COVID. Uh, and uh, half of those who had severe hearing loss had drops in autoacoustic emissions. So this is then evidence um, that outer hair cell function was affected in patients with COVID-19 related hearing loss. And certainly our findings in vitro support that, showing that hair cells uh, are most readily infected by the virus. Great, thank you. So I think that addresses Dr. Chandrasekhar's follow-on question to you. Um, so maybe we'll have one last question here from Dr. Freybeck, uh, directed to Dr. Stewart. Were you able to quantitate viral load in inner ear tissue compared to other sites such as the skin or lung? Yes, thank you, Dr. Raybeck. No, not at all. In our RT-PCR study, uh, it's really just a Boolean yes or no for presence of absence there for the N1 and N2 uh, uh, nucleocapsid uh, gene. We definitely will be looking at, uh, at that in both our TEM and SEM uh, tissue samples from the middle ear as well as the uh, auditory and vestibular systems of the inner ear. Thank you. Great. Well, I think this concludes our panel. Uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, thank you to our audience for asking those uh, really stimulating questions. And I invite you all to participate in our next panel, Hollywood Squares, moderated by Dr. Cosetti. Thank you.